Hi, I'm Larry Digner from Constellation Insights, and we're here with Matt Lewis. He's part of Constellation Research's AI 150. Hi, Matt. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Larry. Thanks so much for having me. It's a great, great honor to be here. So you're playing at the intersection of life sciences, mental health, and AI. So I guess you want to explain your role and kind of how you're viewing things? Yeah, sure. So it's it's a really interesting time. Generally, it's an interesting time to be alive and to, to be in the space. I'm currently serving as a Global Chief Artificial and Augmented Intelligence Officer at Amnesia Medical. And I'm also in that, in that space, the executive sponsor of Amnesia Medical's mental health business employee resource group, which is a thousand person large division of folks that kind of put our medical affairs kind of value proposition forward. And the mental health Berg is all the folks that are kind of challenged with mental health and well-being issues, either themselves or, you know, their children, their parents as caregivers and the rest. So my world is kind of like a, a mix of how do we leverage emerging technologies like generative artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, NLP, and the rest to speed time to commercialization, uh, but also how do we support the, the mental health and well-being needs of our colleagues and our counterparts and the people with whom we work so that they can live good lives and, and enjoy what they're doing. So how do you see generative AI contributing to mental health? You know, I mean, my, I mean, there are some looming things like, you know, the therapist professions, you know, a lot of folks are aging out, you know, there's cost, there's comfort, there's a bunch of things. How do you see generative AI playing in that space? Yeah, I mean, it, it is one of these things that I think a lot of people, you know, recognize that there's a kind of an imperative technologically to adopt and to kind of put the AI into their world, whether it's, you know, as people, you know, I, I went to a, a, a block party recently and people, you know, at the pool are asking like, how do I use ChatGPT to make my life better? So it's like a real thing that actual people ask about, but in, you know, the board room and in the you know, corporate corridors, people ask the same question. They don't really know how to make sense of it. And in one of the early meetings that we had when I first stepped into role as chief AI officer, and I'd been the chief data analytics officer for years before that. One of the first questions someone asked me was, you know, are robots going to take my job? That's literally what they asked. And, you know, it underlying that question is a, a question of fear, really, and, and anxiety, which are really mental health concerns that are not really kind of questions of, you know, do they know the technology, do they understand its merits and its benefits and its features, but you know, do they feel safe and secure? in their organization to support them in their learning journey as technology is adopted across the enterprise. And a, a lot of people that work in these environments really don't give proper consideration to the kind of psychological or cognitive or affective concerns of knowledge workers in an environment that is rapidly changing. They almost kind of think, oh, well, you know, they're just kind of talking, they're just saying things like robots are gonna take my job, but they don't really kind of give it the proper consideration. And it, as it turns out, the, the research literature on the adoption of artificial intelligence suggests that at least up to 80% of successful adoption in the enterprise is due to what's called human factors. And most of the human factors literature is around psychological considerations of adoption. And it, it, with what we kind of think about in that space, it's like really how sh someone shows up to their role and their role as kind of a counterpart to AI. And if, they don't show up in, in a way that is kind of intentional. They don't show up in a way that is welcoming and they don't try to collaborate with the AI. Lots of bad things happen for themselves as individuals, as professionals, and for the companies with which they work. So really at the, at the core of it, it really is a kind of human factor, kind of mental consideration that determines whether AI adoption is successful or not. But a lot of people just kind of poo poo it the way and say, oh, you know, they're just talking nonsense. What are what are some of those human factors if you were to rank them? Like I, I know there's change management, there's culture, there's a bunch of things, but but I guess how do you I guess what would you rank in terms of, you know, three human factors that, you know, execs need, need to think about? Yeah, I think the the first one that is that comes to mind that, you know, is, is talked about a lot, but it has a number of kind of subcomponents to it is definitely trust. Um, and it's 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 not necessarily just related to artificial intelligence, but to any emerging technology. And honestly, any decision that we as humans make ultimately has trust at the core. I mean, we're not going to you know, hire a plumber to come in and fix our toilet in our bathroom in our home if we don't trust that they're going to do a good job and they're not going to cause our family or ourselves to be at risk while they're in our home. It's, it doesn't matter if it's kind of a basic thing like that or if 
we're going to use, you know, a, a service like ChatGPT that takes our data and potentially sends it off to the cloud and sends it back to OpenAI in California. Fundamentally, if humans don't trust the service or the professional that's providing them value, they won't work with them. And there are so many aspects of how trust is kind of moderated or mediated in a relationship, professionally or personally, that if you don't satisfy that, nothing, nothing really works well. Another big consideration in the human factor environment is uh, what's called like locus of control, which is kind of how the individual perceives themselves to be in like the broader network uh, with which they, they work or they live. So people that tend to kind of consider themselves as part of a, a broader system or a broader network or a community end up working better actually with generative AI than those that consider themselves to be like a lone wolf, if you will, or like really kind of calling all the shots. And it, it also, there's a lot of research, very interesting research that suggests that if you remind people of their spiritual and religious obligations immediately before prompting in, in generative, they're better at working with generative AI than if they just go in blind. And the reason why that is, is that if humans are kind of reminded of the fact that they're not alone in the world, and that there's a connection either to nature or to earth or to a deity that they're able to kind of connect with the other being generative and partner directly. Whereas if they approach generative without that prompt, no pun intended, they, they do so more from a hostile perspective and they don't try to collaborate and the outputs suck. They, they're much worse than if they go at, at it from a kind of position of vulnerability, if you will. So locus of control is probably the second biggest thing. And then I'd say the third biggest thing is what might be called in the in the psychological literature and the adult learning literature, which I did most of my doctoral degree in, is around like self-efficacy, which is like the intention to act or like, you know, the confidence that someone has in their ability to actually perform a task. And a lot of people, even like very highly technical people, like people that have, you know, medical degrees, PhDs, PharmDs, very technical people. And these are the people with whom I work regularly across both Inizio and in the life sciences ecosystem, they don't really rate their own skills with deep tech, with emerging tech, with you know general artificial intelligence, with emerging tech, blockchain, VR, anything like that very highly. So when they show up into those environments and are asked to take on the role of thought partner to AI, they don't do well, not because they're not capable, but largely because they're not confident. So they're, they are competent, but they're not confident and as a result, their work suffers because they don't believe in themselves. And, you know, this shows up not just in people that are highly technical, but like our athletes and our Olympians. Like how many times you watch the, the Olympics recently and Simone Biles is talking about the twisties. The twisties is like a self-efficacy thing writ large. People don't believe in what they can do, even though they're super competent. They just don't show up when it matters. So does this mean that you're almost going to have to, I, I'm just thinking aloud about, you know, how this affects the future of work. So are you almost like the people that, I guess, thrive and adapt, or are they going to have to have those three qualities and sort of have that trust level and be willing to collaborate? And, and if so, what that mean, what's that mean for the workforce, especially folks who are, you know, kind of like the lone wolf and want and have control? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of things like all happening at the same time. And it's, it's hard to kind of piece it apart really pull it apart and piece it back together part of it is that the world in which we are working now is is not really set up for the type of transformative change that's happening as a result of generative ai so we're almost like you know we're working in 2024 but generative ai is like making possible a 2031 type of work and there are certain kind of structures and processes and systems that would make 2031 work possible but we just happen not to be living in that environment and uh, like for example when you, when you work with content, any content that originates digitally, it would be preferable to know the origin of that content and to know, for example, like when people view this interaction between you and I, that we're taping it live right now on Friday, September 6th at 11.26 a.m. Eastern, and its origin is recorded directly at this point. But mo most people can't do that. When they watch it directly, they'll only see the asset itself. In 2031, almost guaranteed, every piece of media that emerges into the, the world will have some type of watermark or some type of transparency stamp on it, either from C2PA, which is on the media side, or the equivalent in healthcare and life sciences, so you can derive what's called provenance. 
and be able to say, okay, well, the origination of this was actually a prompt that someone made to a generative platform, and then a human edited it or annotated it or labeled it or curated it or did something to it, and then later it went back through a generative platform and then emerged into the ecosystem as the final deliverable, and you can see the whole kind of chain, the logic chain, if you will. But since people don't have that, all they had was what existed in 2014 or 2004. They tend to approach it with a healthy degree of skepticism, and they don't trust it, understandably. But it's like our systems and our processes haven't caught up with our technology yet, but they will eventually. And when they do, the the trust level will increase dramatically. And when that happens, you won't really have to ask people to do things that they don't, you know, that they're not ready for yet. But for those of us that are deep in on AI and are in this world, we kind of know that that world is coming. It just hasn't appeared yet. For the other two areas, like locus of control and for self-efficacy, I think you're going to start seeing true platforms. And I don't mean like the, the consumer platforms like ChatGPT and Gemini, but true platforms, AI platforms that are being built right now, m- mostly in the startup ecosystem, that focus on things like how do we encourage people in the real world and also in our companies to start showing up as themselves, as their best selves in ways that make them able to, to really contribute fully in the workforce and, and contribute ways that amplify value for the work they're doing and hopefully enjoy the work better because it, it's not fun to, to do work where you don't really like you're not able to contribute the things that you that make you happy because the things you really enjoy doing are like kind of like in your personal time and things you have to do at work or just for work that that that's not great I, I, we've all been there and then on the self-efficacy side it, it it really i think a lot of people feel like they can't do what's required of them because they haven't been trained or uh, they they their company hasn't given them the skills that are necessary to kind of contribute in a an equitable manner when that's actually not necessary at present is it you know i've been in artificial intelligence for 15 years and there was a time back in the late 2000s early 2010s when you really needed like a team a full team of like 20 30 50 100 phds in machine learning to build a single model and keep it running for a going period of time it's just not like that now if you want to see value from generative ai all you really need to do is identify a pressing problem that exists in your life or at, at work find a platform or application that can solve against that and then use it long enough to either get really frustrated that it's not working well or find something else that does work well and then figure out those kind of guardrails as to how to progress it forward and that's really all it takes and if you don't have that type of experience you really can't contribute in a world that is transformed by generative and i think that's the the gap between having confidence to play in this space and not having confidence and I've seen it firsthand in my teams. I've seen it in client environments. It's it's really building experience and kind of growing with the technology, if you will, as opposed to kind of running away from it, as that first person mentioned a couple of years ago, of the robots and the like. And I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the days to come. So in terms of, you know, enterprises, a lot of vendors, they all talk about, you know, the, tr- the trust of generative AI and all that. You know, usually they're talking about corporate data or, you know, things like that or keeping private data secure, but but really the, the whole trust thing needs to be solved before any of this other stuff gets going, correct? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I think, you know, there, there are a number of kind of aspects to trust that, that people either recognize, but don't spend the time to, to really kind of really fix, if you will, or that they, they recognize they're important, but I think they, they think perhaps that they're going to be like someone else's problem, like down the road, like, you know, this is going to be an issue that, you know, our, our kind of predecessors are, are, you know, kind of a, will inherit later, you know, that's not, I didn't say it the right way, but you know, they'll, they'll, you know, that will, these aren't problems that you know, the current leadership will have to deal with, they are problems that'll happen three to five years from now, but it's, it's just not true. They're, they're problems of today. Like, you know, for example, um, I, I, when I speak sometimes, when I do keynotes and other conferences, I'll use examples of some of the activist boards that are trying to claim that existing companies today are not actively including generative AI in their plans and their, their current marketing activities. Um, and when you look at companies like Disney or you know the large kind of blue chip companies out there that have not been proactive in adopting generative artificial intelligence, they indicate that in some of these types of organizations, they, they could potentially transform the entire way that they communicate with their customers and turn what essentially is like a very kind of anachronistic model into more of a 
engagement model with their customers using gender of artificial intelligence. And really what's at issue is not so much the business model, but really how the leadership considers what their business to be and how customers really trust that organization for the value that they accrue. Like whether they come to Disney, for example, for just a theme park or for a streaming platform or for, for example, like a broader experience that is leveraged on the insights of all the activities that undergird the whole kind of corpus that Disney supports. And to get to that like later consideration requires a, a real shift in how current leadership thinks about what it really is in business to do and also how they kind of communicate with, with all their stakeholders. And the, the failure to do that in the near term is encouraging a number of startups out in the, the gender of AI ecosystem to try to solve that same problem of gender of AI experiences using content for family audiences, if you will, that can do it on a shoestring budget and kind of pull those eyeballs away from legacy you know, enterprises. So it, it really is a, a an actual issue today, not like a an issue that will exist three, five years from now. And you know, it's it's it is fixable and solvable, but it's it's not fixable and solvable necessarily by just throwing more software across the enterprise gates. It's fixable really by a, a hard look at kind of who the organization is and who it wants to be and how it can really speak, you know, vulnerably about like where it can create value in, in the ecosystem and how it can do that, you know, given what it's already done historically. And I think every group, if they're not willing to do that, they're going to have threats externally from organizations and entrepreneurs that are willing to do it themselves. So in terms of life sciences, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, the various challenges with, you know, trust and the psychology of Gen AI and working with it. Is life sciences a harder nut to crack or is it about on par with other industries? Yeah, I mean, it, it isn't harder in the sense that that it's not possible. I think it's it's harder for the same reasons that all the regulated industries are challenging because ultimately when you're interacting with consumers, you have to first pass through the regulatory considerations of, at least in this country, the Food and Drug Administration and its counterparts in Europe and in Asia and other markets. So you know, when you're actually talking about, say, getting a drug or a device or a digital therapeutic across to someone that has a health condition, that you can't directly change what you're doing without first getting the say so of a regulatory body, which is different, say, than if you change the flavor of Coke and then you want to put it on shelves. It's a lot easier to do that than it is to, you know, to adjust like a, a drug that your mother is taking, just it's just much harder. That's not to say, though, that a lot of the kind of so-called back office or operational aspects of communicating and commercializing novel science aren't already being transformed by gender AI, and they are. And historically, AI is, has always had a very strong foundation in life sciences and in healthcare as well, especially in areas like research and development and in post-launch marketing and a number of other areas as well that are not as close to the regulatory schema because not being kind of held to those same kind of considerations, there's a lot that is either frictionful, you know, that just doesn't work the way it should, or where there are places to make things more efficient or effective, or to ensure that people doing the work find the work engaging so they stay around with it long enough to bring a, a novel intervention to market. So there are a tremendous number of use cases. Uh, you know, we've partnered on the Benizio side with McKinsey, I've worked with other consultants as well. There are hundreds of use cases within life sciences that are amenable to intervention from a gender AI perspective. The, the challenge is not finding things to do with Gen AI. You could, you know, we could be here all day thinking about things that can be done. The challenge is really aligning those to the priorities of your specific business, both from a resource, time and, and people and financial perspective, as well as finding the people internally and externally that are committed to seeing that through and that from a human factor standpoint, actually want to do it and want to see the outcomes of it benefit the organization. Because if, if they don't want to do it and you just build the thing, build a solution, the platform and then kind of throw it across the fence, they will actively resist it being done and it won't benefit the organization. You'll get these results that people always talk about that you know, 90% of AI projects fail. And that, that is a true statement, but it's probably 90% of those are human factor driven. It's not the software or the model. The models are great now. They weren't always, but it's largely because the people that are adopting them have no interest in seeing them work and they do everything possible to sabotage them once they're actually in their world. I mean, it's, it's almost comical, like, 
Gen AI is, you know, this, this new whiz bang technology and the models are really cool and all that. But end of the day, like any IT project totally depends on the human factors and whether people are into it or not. Yeah. Whether it's data analytics, ERP, pick your, pick your acronym. Like yeah. if, if the troops, if the troops resist it, it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, there used to be this acronym. I, I, you and I probably are old enough to remember this. I don't know if everyone viewing this will remember this, but back when I, I I've had a beard for 26 years, but it didn't always have gray in it. And I, I used to have all the hair on my head. And it wasn't bald on the top, but back in the early, like the late 90s, early 2000s, there used to be this acronym in the space called PEBCAC. It was like the, the problem exists between the chair and the keyboard. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, you'd get you know, all these issues, people couldn't figure out how to use email. They couldn't figure out how to run filters or tag messages. And it wasn't, there was no problem with like Lotus Notes or with, with Outlook. The problem was the person using the software. And it was almost always the person that was the problem. But IT couldn't say like, you know, to the senior vice president, the issue is you. So they used this PEBCAC person exists between the chair, the problem exists between the chair and the keyboard, you know, acronym as, <laughs> as the problem now to be called that human factors. That's really where human factors research came from is, you know, it is the person that's the problem, but you'd rather than blame the person, you need to really think about their motivation or their mental health or their psychology or their, or their interests or their training, or, you know, you said strategic enablement earlier training, like, you know, the people have a lot of experience and expertise when we ask them to do things. And, in life sciences, especially today, in a lot of the economy, it's it's a very difficult time. Like we've just come out of the pandemic, which is a lot of difficulty for a lot of people. A lot of organizations are restructuring. You know, they're, they're it's a difficult economic climate. Those two changes alone are more than a lot of people could handle from a change perspective. And then right. you're throwing generative AI on top of them and saying, hey, like the whole way you've done knowledge work, your whole career is shifting from you know you use software to the software talks to you. And tells you what you should do and a lot of people are like i can't i can't handle that so it's it's a realistic kind of understandable thing that this is this is why this is but you know rather than kind of cast blame on the people that are involved the human factors the community is really trying to make sense of why it is that way and to try to stand up a solution that makes it better because the generative ai wave is not slowing down it's just going to continue to wash across our shores and if we can help people kind of figure out if they need to go grab a surfboard and ride the wave or, you know, run up for the hills or run away from the wave. I, I don't know. But, you know, it, it just kind of telling them that they shouldn't stand there and get hit by the wave is, is, is not helpful. Right. All right. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have or any final points you want to make? I, I would just say that, you know, I, there is a lot of concern these days about generative AI. And I think that it's, it's definitely appropriate for people to be asking good questions and, you know, be thoughtful and considerate about what is at risk and, you know, what potentially the, you know, are dangers and concerns in the space. But I'll also say that I think there's a tremendous opportunity for good as a result of generative AI. And I, I've honestly never been more excited about our collective future as a result of generative AI than any technology I've worked in the 27 years that I've been working in life sciences. There are more true examples of what generative AI can do to help identify diseases early to help people that are suffering improve their actual health today and even if all the ai research stopped today and we just only had access to the actual models that existed today and nothing ever improved which won't won't happen but if, if that were to be the case we could do so much good for humanity just with what's been discovered in the last two years that it would be a major benefit for society just for what we've already discovered but that won't happen what will happen is more likely that the next two, three, five years, we'll see so much benefit for society, hopefully for human health, for mental health, and for all of us as, as people, that the balance of the risks and the benefits will kind of even it, it, it themselves out, I think. And hopefully we'll start seeing, you know, why some of us are so passionate about the space. All right. Thanks for joining us.